Good afternoon, everybody, um, and uh, welcome today to this month's Life Sciences Luncheon. My name is Deborah Pollock Milgate. I'm a partner here at Barnes and Thornburg in the Intellectual Property Department, and I have the pleasure of uh, presenting and introducing the panel today. Now, I think for purposes of today, actually, this would have been a successful panel if almost no one had shown up because that would have told us that actually no one near, needs to hear from these th three gentlemen and everybody is having a very easy time getting his or her, her foot in the door with the big companies. But unfortunately, we have a rather large crowd which tells me that we still have some work to do and that there is going to be a lot to learn from today's panel. So without any further ado, I will go ahead and get started with some short in introductions of the panel today. Um, to my immediate left is Mr. Joe Muldoon. He is the CEO for Fast Biomedical, and Fast Biomedical is a privately held medical technology company in late stage clinical trials located here in Carmel, Indiana. They have developed technology for quantifying blood volume and kidney function. This is a well-validated unmet medical need that meets the FDA's requirements for a rare expedited review. Um, and here's really the key, and you'll see this, this is a trend really for the panel overall. Joe leverages over 30 years of experience from technology startups to publicly traded multinational companies. His expertise is in culture building and value creation from inception through capitalization, commercialization, and exit. Um, and he has worked with many high growth entrepreneurial companies as a board advisor, investor, and CEO. He previously served as an entrepreneur in residence of the Indiana Venture Center and president of BrightPoint North America, which is a 750 billion, right? That's where there are two M's, million. Sorry, I guess billion would be a lot, wouldn't it? <laughs> 750 million publicly traded company. He has a Bachelor of Science in Business from Indiana University's Kelly School of Business, where he is a panelist, often a panelist, and a speaker for MBA programs. And Joe, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, next to Joe Muldoon is uh, Dr. Michael Coleman. He is the president and CEO of Theratome Bio, an Indianapolis-based biotech company that is developing off-the-shelf therapeutics derived from stem, st stem cells. He has worked for only 24 years, the past 24 years, in pharma and biotechnology companies on development and commercialization of gene therapies, cell therapies, and medical devices under U.S., FDA, and EU regulations. He earned his B.S. and M.S. degrees from Texas A&M and his Ph.D. from the Pennsylvania State University. So, and thank you very much, uh, Michael, for joining us today. And then last but not least, here's someone else with a lot of experience. Mr. Carcetti, uh, Steve Carcetti, is currently president and CEO of Apexian Pharmaceuticals, which is an early stage oncology discovery and development company focused in novel targets to treat cancer. He's held key positions at several leading multinational pharmaceutical companies and brings then more than 30 years of commercial industry experience focused in oncology, neurology, urology, endocrinology, and cardiology. He has previously served as CEO of Cornerstone Pharmaceuticals, an oncology company focused in cancer metabolism, and he served as the executive vice president and president for commercial operations in North America for Malincroft Pharmaceuticals. Prior to that, he was the chief marketing officer at General Electric and in commercial leadership roles at, I think, just about every place possible, but Johnson & Johnson, Eli Lilly, Endo Pharmaceuticals, and Bristol Myers Squibb. So that's pretty much everybody, right? <laughs> he has a BS in marketing from Westchester University and an MBA in marketing from Drexel University. Um, and thanks for joining us today. So as you can see, we have a panel of um, experts who've been in, been in the industry for a while. Um, and I'd like to start off with a very general question um, just to, I think, get to the, the key point of um, small you know, startups and, and getting your foot in the door. And so would you, each one of you, speak to one of the challenges um, that you've either faced or are facing now? And I know there are many, so, but, so let's just focus on one. 
Um, and, and Steve, maybe we can, can start with you down there. What do you consider to be your biggest challenge as a bioscience startup? Or, and again, past or present? Oh, here we go. Can that you hear sounds me? great. Okay, great. So I, I think I could characterize it kind of in a nutshell, and that is getting to the right person. As simple as that. I know that's not rocket science, but the challenge is always making sure that regardless of how sophisticated, effective, you know, uh, your technology is, getting to the right person is really, at the end of the day, the most important thing. And that sounds easy to do when you kind of understand a little bit about the landscape and the pharmaceutical industry and who the players are. But actually, it really isn't. And, and, and the big issue is understanding, I think, the, the cultural dynamics of the different kinds of companies that are out there and who that right person is based on the technology that you have to offer. So that would be my, my starting point is, is getting to who you think really is going to make the difference. And we will talk about this a lot later, but is there a particular, again, we will talk about because this is really the, this, this is the key sure. issue, but it, it, what has been your personal approach to overcome that challenge? You know, I think the best way is, um, uh, is networking and connecting with as many people uh, uh, in that organization that you can possibly uh, meet. Uh, I think the other important part is, is spend a little bit of time understanding the, uh, the company itself and uh, in, in the respective division that you may be operating with. So, you know, if you're dealing with like a company like Pfizer, which is obviously a conglomerate of different organizations, you need to understand what, you know, the therapeutic area that you're focused in, how that culture, that dynamic of that company is compared to the other areas of, of Pfizer as an example. So, to me, uh, you have to do quite a bit of homework in, in, in that regard, and then quite a bit of, we'll call it networking with people in that, in that group as much as you possibly can. And I would, I would uh, never underestimate the importance of anyone that happens to be in an organization. It doesn't necessarily have to be the head of business development or the head of R&D or the head of the respective group. You'd be uh, surprised at how, um, how effective, let's say, an administrative assistant who you come to know uh, works in that organization can really help you. And uh, so, you know, it, it comes from all different approaches. It's not necessarily just going to the top, it's across the board. But I, I find getting to know the company and getting to know the people as much as you can. So be nice to everyone. Yeah, I know that's the same skill I tell my kids when they, uh, they, they go for interviews, right? Be as uh, cordial and professional to the person at the front desk as the person you're actually going to have to interview with because you never know how that all turns out. Michael, what about you? I think that's a great answer that was given. The only thing I'd add is, is it's a challenge for me as a scientist to always be selling. And um, I would point out, for example, we need to do a lot of things outsourcing. So when you're dealing with CROs, you may not be a big near-term source of revenue for them. So you somehow got to convince them that you're going to be a significant customer in the long term. Uh, and get them to commit mind share uh, in people to your project, whether that's providing cost estimates that you need, um, um, helping you plan things. Um, that, that is a people management issue, and you've got to always be selling the company and, and get them on board with your project. And so, Michael, when you say the, the biggest challenge is that uh, you are not revenue, you're talking about because of the, the size of sure. the company you represent? Sure. Sure. We're not literally going with them with a commercial antibody where they're going to make, you know, right. 10,000 liter scale material. We're talking about pilot scale material. So, so we've got to convince them that it's worth their time. And that's uh, particularly challenging uh, in some spaces now because there's such high demand in these CROs uh, and CMOs that, um, you know, there's a lot of competition. And so you have to make sure that you're always at the front of the line. And your, your approach to that is then to try to get them invested in what you're actually working Ab on. Absolutely. Project. Get to know, as I said, uh, the people in the organization. Um, you learn very quickly after meeting with folks who the influencers are. It may not always be the, the head person. Mm -hmm. It may be a, a senior scientist in the process development group, for example. Um, and get to know that person and make sure they're on board with your project. And. and um, Joe, so we we started, or I started off this with asking what the biggest challenge is. Is your is your answer going to be the same thing? The biggest challenge is, is getting the right person, or, or what? No. What, okay. Oh, good. Go ahead. <laughs> so I know the session is all about takeaway learning. So before I answer your question, one takeaway piece of advice is when you're on a panel, and you're the only one that has a handheld microphone, 
the reason they do that is they can cut off the handheld microphone. They can <laughs> shut it off. Um, our biggest challenges today and our biggest challenges when we started is uh, to get the right financial capital and the right human capital at the right time and, and on the right terms. Those are, those are our two biggest challenges. They're the two biggest things we have to get right, and that's not changed. Okay, and what's your approach then to overcome those challenges? You're always raising money, even when you don't need it, even when you're between rounds, and you're always recruiting people, even when you don't have a position to fill. So, you know, we'll, we'll probably put on a full-time CFO uh, 18 months from now. I already know the four people. Well, like, I already know my four candidates. I know where they are. I know what they're doing. I keep in contact with them. Um, we raised... We closed our last round early this year, and the wire hit at 2.15 p.m. on a Tuesday, and my first call with a potential new investor for my next round was 5 p.m. that night. So in less than 90 minutes, we were already starting to precondition the market for our next round. So did you have a glass of champagne in between? <laughs> no, but I had several after that call. <laughs> And just for the record, so you know, you got stuck with the handheld because I didn't want it. <laughs> so if you want to take a break, we can switch. Are you okay? Okay. Um, all right. So we're going to come back to this issue again and again, and that is, you know, how are you getting, how do you get your foot in the door, right, which is, is our entire conversation. What is the most effective way to get the, industry, the interest of, of an industry giant? And I, I think, Michael, if, if you could start with this, because I think you were the one who, who talked about the black hole approach. Was that you, Michael? Or did I get that wrong? I think many of us, may, may have, all of us may have brought that up at one time, but I'm happy to. Did you use that term? I, I have used that term. Okay. Yes. All right. I think you're on the hook then. <laughs> <laughs> so what I can comment, I, I did spend some time as head of R&D in, in a large pharma organization. And... Um, Small companies make the mistake of doing what I would call cold call. And you just don't have time to deal with these sorts of things. So you need to get past that. And what, at least in the organization I was in, had, had the most traction was to actually have someone who might be a key opinion leader, someone on the clinical and scientific advisory board, or a key scientist in the company bring your project and make a warm introduction inside the company or enthusiastic. It's like I was talking about the CRO to make these people advocates for your technology within the company. Uh, and cultivating those relationships takes some time. Um, you have to engage them outside of the environment of confidentiality and the official company channels. So that's, that's the way to get out of the black hole. Because if you send something cold to the business development group at any pharma company I've ever been associated with, whether it's on small company or the big company, that is a black hole. <laughs> so I'm going to ask a I'm going to ask a follow up question. I think I'm going to try to quote you again. I think you said something about non traditional avenues. Um, see, I, I guess I I'm misquoting you again. No, I may have, I may have mentioned non traditional. I again thinking about how projects get started inside of pharma. Mm -hmm. So if your customer is a large pharmaceutical company the uh, genesis of those projects inside the company is discovery. Or by competitive example, they see something going on in the literature and they say, hey, this could be interesting, what's the IP and so on. Make sure that your project takes the same route. And that's through either outside key opinion leaders that have a relationship with the company, uh, a clinician or a scientist, or key scientists within the company and they champion your product. You're not the one selling the product or the technology. Um, and I, I'm not sure if that's necessarily non-traditional, but I think that's the most effective route. Well, it sounds smart, right? Because you're now not asking for the large company to um, go against what its normal procedure would be, right. um, which I imagine can be can be challenging. Steve? Well, I mean, I, I just had, if you think about, I'm sure there are a lot of people here that work for big, big pharma companies in their careers, right? I can tell you this. The one thing they have is they have a process. There's a process for everything. And there's a big process for business development evaluation. And I can tell you that when you get sucked into that process, it is not very productive. I'll be totally honest with you. Um, many of those systems are designed to put together departments to review technology. And um, I hate to say it, it's a lot of busy work. And 
I can't recall that I can't recall a time in my 30 plus year career with at least five big pharma companies where something quote unquote ran through the process and we came out saying that's the asset we want to go for. It just doesn't work that way. I mean, they built the machine, but it doesn't produce anything on the back end. Having said all that, the what has worked and what what I think as small companies you, you need to look at is if you have to have some kind of an internal champion. Um, big pharma companies like to think they've discovered and figured something out themselves. They found it, right? They went to the uh, ASCO meeting where they went to, where they were, where they're plowing through reading uh, journals and they discovered this great technology which happens to be your company. They love that because then they go back and they kind of justify their existence by saying, hey, I stumbled across this company, I think we should talk to them. And that's when you get those phone calls that you, you, know, you don't expect or, hey, you get the call, uh, you want to meet at, at, at such and such conference. So I, I, think, I think that's, if you think about that dynamic, right, you know, it's pure, purely simple. They want to feel important, and forgive all the big pharma people here in the room, they want to feel important, they want to feel that they've discovered it, and they want to be the people leading it, which is wonderful as long as they happen to use your technology in, in, in evaluation. But if, if you, uh, to, to the point that was raised earlier, um, cold calling, sending bl the emails, um, you're going to get thrown into the into the, uh, the the black black hole, if you will, and you're going to get through the process. And I would tell you, you know, ten times out of ten, you'll get the obligatory email back, which says, "Thank you very much. Your technologies are very interesting." And I love this terminology. It doesn't meet our strategic fit criteria, right? <laughs> which you know is, is a polite way of saying, "Don't call me anymore." Um, and, and 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 no matter how you know how how important how well it fits, so. You have to be mindful. You're dealing with a big machine that has this process. And the challenge for you is to somehow, I hate to say it this way, but circumvent that machine so you get a little bit more attention. Because if you get thrown in that machine, you'll be item number 152. And you know, you'll get the polite strategic fit, or lack thereof, email. So um, you, you've got you've to go around that in some way in a different approach. I, I, that's what I found to be most effective. I, I've, I've rarely been successful getting through that big, that big machine. And it's the same, by the way, pick the company. They have a different acronym for the process, you know. And it's the most well thought out. I think it's McKinsey or some, one of these big consulting firms selling uh, these big pharma companies on. Put this process in place. It'll help you triage technology. and You'll be at the forefront of learning everything is new. Um, nothing beats just the, you know, beating the pavement and, and meeting folks and going to conferences and reading technology for those companies. Those are the ones that, be, that are successful. So, Steve and Michael, this is for both of you. So, I think I heard, and I want to figure out if there's a way to reconcile this. Um, I think I heard from you, Michael, that you, you have to understand the process, right, of the organization so that you don't fall outside that process. And now, Steve, I think you said the, the process is... I'm just telling you my experiences. So do we have a happy medium yeah. some, well, somewhere here? I think we actually agree. Okay, I, that's what, what I was what hoping What I'm saying is say. you need to understand if, if it's Eli Lilly or Roche, how they get a, a, a new molecule into their pipeline. What is that process internally? And make sure that you try to follow that as quickly as possible. I completely agree. The business development lead generation process, that's a black hole. And there's no, I think that's time lost to focus on that. So I, I, I think we're aligned. You need to cultivate the relationships with the scientists and the decision makers related to the portfolio from the nascent stage. By the way, that's the best job in the world, if you can get it, is to be part of that business development process because you evaluate a whole bunch of technology and, and you're not held accountable for anything. So it's, it's, it's a great job if you can get it. But uh, sorry for those that are falling in that field here. But um, I, I just think it, I don't think it's very productive. You know, it, it, really, it really is. And that, that's, you know, and this is, so I'm speaking from someone who's run that process for other companies because you have to say to yourself, how many big breakthrough technologies that have been in license for big pharma have come through their evaluation process, and I bet you'd find very, very few. All right, Joe. So it's your turn. What have you found to be the most effective way to get the interest of an industry giant to avoid this black hole? I agree with everything they said. I guess a couple um, maybe additional elements I'd, I'd put on it. You're right, you gotta lead with the science, you have to lead with the data. There is an internal review process on the science. You're not going to circumvent that. 
business development is often the land of misfit toys. It's where uh, ideas go to die. So try and stay out of that if you can. You, you need an internal champion, but I guess what I'd add to it is, you know, companies respond to competitive pressure. So you never want just one. You, you want, as you're, as you're trying to get internal advocates, be trying to get internal advocates and in six targets at the same time because people actually start to respond when they think they might want to, they're going to lose something. Um, and uh, it's always better if it's their idea to come to you versus your idea to come to them. So you're judged by the company you keep. Um, we've gotten leads through some of our development partners that were helping us work on an aspect of the technology or a publication that went out or something they learned at a scientific conference. It's always much better if it's their idea to talk to you than if it's your idea to talk to them. And it's even better if you're a little too busy when they first come to talk yeah, to them because you're talking to two other people and then all of a sudden, you know, some of the some of the minutiae in the process drops away pretty quickly. So, Joe, both you and Steve touched on this a little bit about the idea belonging uh, not necessarily to you or the idea of uh, the interest in your, in your company is, originates from, from the large company and not the other way around. Um, is there a danger there or have you encountered a danger in that not only the idea to approach you but also the ideas themselves might be misappropriated by the company? In other words, is it enough that you have just given, you have, they are interested in you and they've happened upon you and they don't have an independent stake in the actual technology ownership? Do you follow my, my thought process there? Not completely. Yeah. yeah, so are you worried that they will actually exercise some sort of ownership in the technology itself in having the idea as you, as you refer to it? Okay, I understand your question. No, because in the context of what I'm talking about, um, uh, the idea is not the intellectual property. The, the idea is um, we may both be recognizing or hopefully several people recognizing at the same time an unmet medical need and what solutions would be able to do to address that unmet medical need and we happen to have one of those solutions that we have tight intellectual property around. Okay. Um, and we are um, very uh, disciplined then when it comes time to talk about it. Um, making sure a CDA is in place at the right time, which is not too early. I think people worry about that too early, frankly, and it's just, it's just an impediment. We can tell people an awful lot about what we're doing without divulging anything that's, you know, uh, a secret. Um, and, you know, for us, it's been more key with the material transfers agreements. Okay, now there's enough interest. Give me some of your stuff and I want to play with it. Okay, that's a real <laughs> potential danger area. So you want to make sure the agreement around what can you do with it, how do I get it back, um, is clear. Okay. Yeah, thank you for the clarification. Steve, anything to add? Yeah, no, I, I, I never have really much of a problem with sharing a lot of information with uh, potential parties in the process. Obviously, nothing secretive, but I think you've got to be open, honest, and transparent. And, and, and I would tell you this, again, if I, if I wear my big pharma hat, which I've, now, I've been on both sides of the fence here, wear my big pharma hat, and I think about what, have been, what are some of like, uh, my pet peeves when you're in big pharma when you have a small company come in. The first is small companies sometimes, and not this, not this esteemed panel, of course, um, can be a little arrogant because they feel they know an awful lot about their technology, they think they're going to cure their next disease, and, and, and that may all be true, but that's a big turnoff uh, to big pharma who think they know everything. So you have to be mindful of not coming across too um, uh, uh, elitist with your technology, and, and, and they do that by saying, well, I can't share that with you because you know, we're, we're the only people that know this, and uh, we need to sign a CDA, and we need to go to... That, that's a major turnoff. So I, I'm a big believer of open, honest, and transparent communication with, with potential parties because at the end of the day, you're looking at strategic partnership, and if you don't have that transparency and you don't build that from the very beginning, that trust, then, um, then you really probably you shouldn't be in that room. Um, and that may be more generous than I think most companies are because I, 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 true to believe, I, I believe that most big pharma companies that have a vested interest in their reputation are not in, the not in the business of necessarily stealing technology and making small companies go bankrupt. That's not a very good business model for them. So I err on more of the side of transparency than, uh, than just trying to be secretive because I don't think that really pays off in the end. 
but that's why we have hired lawyers like you guys. To help I, I, was, I was going to say, I'm not, you know, as, yeah. as the moderator, I don't want to step in here too, but um, certainly, you know, th things can go awry. Sure. Um, so uh, I, I think, and we'll talk about this more, um, but Joe, as you started off with, you know, not disclosing sort of the, the how, I think, is, is really what you're talking about, um, the secret sauce. Um, I think everybody's uh, of the mindset that that's, that's probably a good, a good approach yeah. to take. I think. No, I think, I think okay. it is. All right. I mean, you yeah. don't want to disclose the secret sauce, right? Right. But you don't want to say, well, I can't give you that patent number because, you know, I mean, if it's a filed patent, you're just going to save them time to look it up, right? Right. right. I mean, so, <laughs> but, there, but you'd be surprised how many small companies going, well, I can't give you my IP estate. I don't want to go through that with you right now. We don't know. We're not under CDA. I'm like, listen, these companies have armies of people. If they really want to dig into your data, they will find everything about it, okay? Um, I, they will. They're, they're, they're smart and they know how to do it. So I hate to say it, but I sometimes like, well, why, why not save them the trouble, right? I mean, the sooner they get to know me, the sooner I get to work with them, right? And I, I think I just, if you believe it, and I, you know, like I said, I hope that most organizations are not unethical and we don't have a need for attorneys to help uh, resolve that, any kind of dispute. It happens. It happens. But um, you just have to be, be smart. You just be smart on what you share and what you don't. But don't be arrogant about not sharing information simply because you think it's going to give them some competitive advantage. They can figure it out on their own. So just so you know, I still have plenty to do. <laughs> <laughs> In case you were worried. I think you were worried. Yeah, I was. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, so, so let's go back to the, you know, again, getting the interest of the industry, the interest of the industry giant. How does or should this approach vary depending on who your target is? Um, and, and the business structure. That could be size, culture, location, all of those things. Joe, would you like to start off with this one? Sure. Um, you know, we've uh, noticed um, differences geographically, uh, particularly U.S. versus outside U.S. or, or more specifically Western Europe. Um, uh, the speed at which things move, the priority of information that they want to understand and how that can kind of be flip-flop. So you just you just start to understand their process and, and try and accommodate it. Um, you know, big companies move more slowly than smaller companies, um, but sometimes, at least on the scientific evaluation side, have a, have a much more robust and, and um, more logical process of trying to kind of really knock down the big things that are going to make it a showstopper early, whereas the smaller and medium size sometimes can... Um, well-intentioned, uh, spend a lot of your time in that, and you almost have to coach them along about let's let's try and understand you know these two things first before we do a deep dive in, in area number three. Michael, I would only add to that that one assessment to make up front, in my experience, is whether the company wants to be in control or whether they want to collaborate, and that can govern how you interact with the company. Um, if the company's willing to pay me, I'm happy for them to be in control as long as I'm going to maintain my ability to get paid going forward. That's IT and licensing and so on. So I think that uh, particularly uh, biotech tends to be more collaborative than pharma. Uh, someone like a Merck or a Pfizer, um, you know, if you've got a compound or a drug that's already well characterized and ready to go to trials, they may want to control everything. And so they don't really need you for a lot. And, and that can be okay, but I think that's one of the things you need to understand up front. Steve, is there anything I, you'd I like think to there, add Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there are huge geographical differences. Mm -hmm. I think you, you're dealing with companies on the East Coast. Um, listen, at the end of the day, you know, in, in pharma, the, the biotech mecca, if you will, is Boston and San, South San Francisco. And everything else in between is just, you know, window dressing, unfortunately. And um, there's huge differences when you're dealing with companies that are based in, in Boston or New York and how they operate, to, to, to Mike's point earlier, about you know, their biotechs in, in the Boston area. They're, they're fast, they're nimble, they, they want to partner, they want to make meaningful impact. Many of them are early stage public companies. They're trying to get their stock price up, so they want to get a press release. So there's a lot of movement, right? Um, and I would say the same in, in, the, in the Bay Area. You've got a lot of companies that really want to move quickly. They're used to building these companies, and, and people are used to becoming millionaires pretty quickly. Um, the Midwest, um, 
it's challenging. You know, it's challenging. Uh, um, you know, one of you know the biggest challenge for 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 me and my company is that uh, you know not the bare bad bad news, but we're based here in Indianapolis, right? And we're just not in that that arena. So when you're dealing with companies here, it's a little bit uh, different. And and it goes the same with you know dealing with other pharma companies here. Um, there's, you know, we've been dealing with a company, a big company in the Indianapolis area that shall be renamed na nameless. I'm sure half the people here have worked for it. And I have myself. And I would tell you, of all the companies that I have to deal with, it's been the most difficult one to actually get, you know, get in touch with and get connected. And I worked there for 10 years. And every one of my employees are former Lilly people. So it's, it's, it's a different dynamic, right? It's, it's a different dynamic, and, and maybe that's part of uh, the not invented here mentality um, of some companies. Some companies have that. So I think there are huge cultural di differences. I think there are huge geographic differences, and uh, I think you have to be mindful of that. And, and at some point, you also have to say to yourself, you know what? It's not going to be a fit. I'm not going to waste my time there. Or I'm not gonna. And that's a tough decision you have to make as a CEO. Um, but, you know, you have to be careful. You, know, you may look at... At, at a company like Pfizer, who's, you know, it's like kill or be killed, right? And you may say, you know what, that might not be the best partnership for me. They may be the best at maybe making tens of millions of dollars for our asset, but this may not be the best partnership. Because to, your, to Michael's point, you, you want to preserve some involvement in, in the process, right? Um, unless you want to just exit the company and walk away. You want to have something there. So I, I think you have to just be mindful of, you know, who you plan on marrying and making sure that, that they have the same cultural values and geography that you do. Well, that's, that's advice for life. Yeah. Um, so we have a lot of questions from, from the audience, so I'd like to take just a minute and, and address some of those. Um, one of our audience members noted that um, all of your companies are based on tor or, or incorporate technology originally invented at Indiana University. Is that? That's right. I am, for sure. Yeah. yeah. OK. So that much we've established. Um, how would you say that has played uh, a role in, in the company's path forward, positive or negative? So I guess the overall question more generally is, um, how, how does technology from a university in general, how does that factor in to your thoughts on, on getting, getting your foot in the door? Is it helpful? Not? Oh, boy. Um. I'll take a crack at that one first. Uh, it depends on which university you got your technology from, and then it depends on who your audience is. Um, you know, I would say it has helped us in that um, Indiana University's medical school is well known globally, and 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 there are some types of investors that really like uh, intellectual property that started to come out of a, a well known. Uh, university um, and that that gives it extra credibility uh, there are other investors that are concerned and rightly so of the terms that you agreed to when you got that intellectual property and I've seen even in the time that we've been at this um, what are market terms for licensing IP has changed pretty dramatically and some of the uh, universities uh, that were moving into the space more were, were maybe a, a bit overly aggressive on what they thought they could get um, for it, especially early when, when cash is, is king. And those terms have kind of morphed over time. Some of them have caught up to market, some of them have not. And some of your sophisticated new investors know to be wary of that and understand what those terms are early because uh, they don't want to go back to renegotiate with your university partner if they think they're unrealistic. Hmm. So both a negative and a positive side, fairly, fairly positive and, and fairly um, substantial on the other hand. Okay. Anybody else? I think it's an asset, really, okay. to, to have IP from a university, particularly if there are patents behind it and publications behind it, and you have a key opinion leader behind it at the university who has a high-profile lab. That's all positive, and I would say from my experience, um, IU is a good institution to work with. They are you know, open-minded, flexible, uh, not as dogmatic as some other state universities I've had to deal with. Uh, the simplest university I've ever worked with is Rice. The small private university in Texas, they generate a lot of bioengineering type IP. 
uh, and they're spectacular because everybody who makes a decision sits in the same room. I would contrast that to the University mm -hmm. of Texas if you want to make a license from, say, MD Anderson, that's the University of Texas institution there in Houston, there's a big bureaucracy there, and then everything has to go to Austin. So, you know, we talk about the black hole of pharma, there's also the black hole of state universities. And um, that's something that, you know, you can lose a lot of time and also spend a lot of money on lawyers and such. But it's important, as was stated, to get those initial license agreement right. Mm -hmm. You don't want to have to go back and renegotiate that. And if you're raising money, particularly from professional investors, they're going to look at those terms. Yeah, that's a great point to be taking a look at your um, your agreement in the first place and making mm -hmm. sure that you still have what you need to move forward with a large company. Right. Yeah, um, it, Steve, it, this may be a good question for you. Can can I put a commercial in for IU? Because uh, <laughs> I think it's already. I think well, we had the commercial. I, I, I did right? honestly. I, I, I say this. I, I am a huge fan of IU and, and the medical center for for a number of reasons. One, I think the people are fantastic. But two reputation outside of the Indianapolis area is, is quite profound. And that really is, at the end of the day, your answer, to answer your question, it's having a validation point, having a, let's say, a research institution that is uh, uh, thought leading in the field that you're, uh, that you're in, and, um, and people recognize that, and that's important. So I, I'm a big uh, fan of, of what IU does, um, independent of the partnership that we have from some of the technology we license, because I think they're doing, they're doing really good work. And, uh, and I think the outside world, and, and we're in the oncology field, so some, some treatment regimens that have been standards of care have been developed at IU. So it doesn't hurt to have, you know, a good name to be a partner with than it is, you know, some small, small school. So right. I'm well, a big, big, big fan. And just to level the playing field, we, we clearly have a number of top-notch institutions in Indiana um, that, that we can deal with. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're very lucky in that regard. I feel like I need to say so. that. <laughs> Um, yeah, right. And it's true. It's true, too. It's yeah. also true. Um, so, uh, Steve, I think yeah. this is a, a good one for you, um, a question for those formerly in Big Pharma. We hear a lot. Keep us posted on your progress. Um, is this a sign of our interest or an effort at polite rejection? Oh, my gosh. I, I love, you know, I, it's a love-hate relationship, right? Keep informing your progress. I'll tell you what, that's, what that is. That is a company just keeping you on the ropes because when their senior manager comes to them one day and says, have you ever heard of this company? They go, we've been talking to them for years. <laughs> we've been meeting with them every, every, and every meeting we go to. That is all that is for, is to just keep you on the hook. And I, I'll tell you this, one of the most powerful things that, that I've found is when a big pharma says, hey, we're, are you going to, in our case, there's a meeting called ASCO. It's a big oncology conference. It happens once a year. Are you going to ASCO? We say, of course we're going to ask her. We're going to meet and say, well, we'd like to meet with you to get the update. And the best thing you do is say, sorry, my dance card is full. I can't meet with you. I'm right. too busy. Yeah, right? that goes back to Joe's point, and, and, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, and I know that sounds counterintuitive, but I, I can tell you, they go, well, who are they meeting with? You know, like, why are we not included? You know, what, what's going on? You know, there's a little bit. So you, you have to be careful how you play that card, but I, I would tell you that it is not necessarily a polite rejection. It's a polite way for them. This they're interested in your technology. It keep, gives them a reason to go to the meeting, right? Because they stack them all up. Um, and uh, and if you do meet with them, the key uh, metric is who's going to attend. So if you go to that meeting, you're meeting with all the let's say uh, associate directors of the department who are there because they want to have a meeting to go to. That's one. If you go there and they said head of R and D. You know, three other scientists are going to be there and, and some in the clinical group, they want to sit and talk with you. That's a little bit of a different proposition. So my, my question is either I say, thanks, but no thanks, because we're busy, or who, who's going to join you in that meeting? And that will tell you everything. Um, so that's, that's what. So that relates to another question, um, too, that, it, that is on our list. And that is, what is your, who's the person you're supposed to be courting? Uh, who's your best, and, and I know we've spoken to that you should be nice to everyone, and so there are a number of ways in to an organization. But in terms of that meeting, and, and just more generally, who is, the, who is the person you want to meet? And you don't have to be on the hook for this one. I just would like to I, ask I'd be happy to tell, I'd, not to, to control the conversation, but I, I would say that um, you know, there, there's always one person, usually a scientist, that has a particular interest in um, your field. And whoever that gal or guy is, that's the guy that you want. You, you've got to have an internal champion who is an expert in that area who can go to their head of R&D or what have you 
and say, hey, I was at this meeting and there's this company doing some very interesting stuff with X, Y, and Z. And you know, I did my PhD in that. And oh, by the way, I think these guys are state of the art. We should talk with them. That's the person you want. You need that internal champion to kind of bubble it inside and bring it up into, your, into the group, right? Um, and it's different for every company. It can be, you know, uh, an R&D person who's just doing research in the area. It could be head of the clinical group. It could be a different, but I found that the scientists who are passionate about the area, who have done research in that area, is the best person to get to, right? That's one. The second is if you can get a key opinion leader, somebody who's, you know, renowned in the field um, to champion your cause and say, listen, you know, we're, we've been trying to, you know, these guys are all signed up for various advisory boards with all these companies. If you get a key opinion leader and that key opinion leader calls on your behalf and says, you know, you should talk to these guys, uh, that's another two. I found those are the probably two best paths to try to get your technology kind of bubbled up in the organization rather than trying the, the BD side. Michael, what, or Joe, no, go ahead, Joe. Go ahead, Bill. For us, it's a little different. So we're not a therapeutic, we're not a biotech. Um, if it's a strategic partner, the most important people for us to get to are the medical directors and the clinical leads because they don't care if your technology works before they care about the unmet medical need. And um, if they're already focused or they're already looking at that space, those medical directors or those clinical leads not only understand the unmet medical need, they understand all the things that are going on to try and address it so they can much more easily evaluate you and how you're differentiated against everybody else. So for us, it's, it's medical directors and clinical leads. But still on the science side, right? Um, they're, they're more on the science side than the business side, but they're, they're really in the clinical, um, the clinical silo is what they're focused on. They're, they're less in the hardcore science. They're more on how does it work in the hospital? How does, you know, what kinds of patients does it help and how? Michael? I, I would second that. I think that you, you, you have different touch points in the organization. Mm -hmm. You can have an outside advisor, that's a key touch point, or an internal scientist, but you also need the therapeutic area head or the person who's actually going to report to management that can actually push the decision. A scientist in the lab can, can bring that to their supervisor and get it into the pipeline, but you need someone who's going to be able to uh, influence the decision at the end of the day because these decisions are made you know, at quarterly meetings and things like this. And um, I think you need someone who's a champion at that level. So another question from the audience with respect to, to follow-up. Um, you're trying to, to uh, get, in, get in the door and you've been, you haven't been told no at least, right? And, and you're keeping people up to date from time to time. How often, how often and, and what means should you use to follow up? Do you, is it LinkedIn, a handwritten note? Any, any thoughts on that? Events. Go ahead, good. I, I see Publications, patents, key presentations mm -hmm. at scientific yes. meetings, maybe something that uh, a competitor did that, that shines a, a positive light on what you're doing. Like, hey, we were there six months ahead of time or something. Um, you know, anything like that that's a public event that you can bring to their attention and share, uh, particularly what I would call peer reviewed or objective information, mm -hmm. is helpful. Uh, as, as a time to get back. And then there are, you know, if you've agreed on a specific time frame, of course, follow up there. I find it's best to call them every weekend at home. <laughs> <laughs> no, same thing. Like, so. Get their home phone number. <laughs> right. uh, when you have something relevant to tell them, right? So if it's, if you're working a specific lead and they're like, yeah, give us three weeks because we, then, you know, you know, to follow up with them in three weeks. But if it's, hey, we're interested, keep us posted. Uh, we put everybody else in kind of a big bucket of we're going to touch you when we have something really relevant to say. We just did a press release on a publication. Uh, we're, you know, one of our medical directors is on the podium uh, talking about the results from a clinical trial when it's really relevant. And then we'll put them in kind of a generic touch to let them know, oh, by the way, you're not the only one I'm keeping in contact with. But, well, who else? Who else are you know, they sending this to? And so it sounds like there's the other lesson here is also that you should be doing those things all the time, right, to, to continue to, to get the interest. Is that right? I mean, I'm assuming if you're doing your job and you're doing the ongoing research, then you're also able to keep in contact at a fairly regular pace. Is that Yeah, I, I, think, I, think, it, I think Joe's point is a good one. It's got to be meaningful. Otherwise, yeah. it becomes irritating. 
right? I right. mean, how many, we all get tons of emails. The last thing we want is a few more, right? So I would just argue that be mindful of what you send and make sure it has some meaningful point for sending it. The second thing I'd say, to the extent, if there's one bit of advice I give all of you, and that is meet people in person if you can and find a reason to meet them, wherever it may be, whether it's at a conference, get to know the head of R&D and have a face-to-face, because -face, um, it's hard to say no when you're standing in front of you and, and, and you also have a touch point where you can say, hey, remember I met you at XYZ, I'm just sending this because you mentioned to send me an update. So there's, there's a relationship that's being built along the process. So make sure it's meaningful and, and to the extent you can, build a face-to-face -face relationship with the head of the group or, or, or somebody that's representing the company because they'll carry the ball with you if they know who you are. And when you meet them, the, only, the other thing I would get, give you advice on is um, get to know them, right? Don't just go and say, let me show you my clinical data, by the way, and you start going through the presentation and the sell sheet, right? Get to know who they are, you know? Where they live, what they're, you know, how many kids they have. What, get to know them because people like to work with other people, not just co you know, companies sending them dated information. And the more that you can build a positive relationship with that person, the more likely when you send that email, they're going to read it, and the more likely they're actually going to respond. I mean, it's, it's simple, basic kind of you know, professionalism, but you'd be surprised at how often that goes right out the window when people are so anxious to get my data in front of them. Because these guys are barraged with people, I mean, all the time, tons of emails. If you have to choose between relevance and frequency, choose relevance. Yeah, for uh, sure. And then the other thing that we've done that I think has been uh, effective because it's so rare is we'll find a partner that we think could be relevant to us when we're further down the road, and we meet with them first and say, hey, we just want to tell you we're in this space. We think you might be interested in it when we're at this juncture. We're not there yet. We think we'll be there in a year, and we'll come back when we are, and then we come back. Because, like, nobody does that. Nobody says, I don't need you right now. I don't need your money right now. I just wanted to get on your radar screen. We're going to go do these important things, and then I'm going to come back when they're done. And you come back, and they're like, wow, most people don't do that. And the ones that do almost never come back, right? <laughs> they, don't, they don't get there. So it's just a way to kind of differentiate yourself. Yeah, that's nice. There's a great message, which is, I don't need your money. Right, that's, that's always a message companies like to hear. Um, so this next question relates to something that, um, Michael, I think you touched upon briefly, and that is experience with CROs. Um, and I know you mentioned one challenge would be to get their attention when you're a small player. Um, what other issues in particular, what challenges ha have you found other than, the, again, the size issue? And this, again, could be anybody. Don't take anything for granted, um, particularly if you're working with a new technology. They may have some very expert people, but they are not expert on your technology. So you need to almost be embedded at the CRO to make sure that they are doing things properly. Um, and, you know, I can, we don't have time today to share stories about manufacturing challenges from the past. But, mm -hmm. but I can tell you we were on clinical hold for six months because someone wasn't in the Netherlands. And we had a San Francisco company that decided to manufacture in the Netherlands. That was a big mistake. If we can manufacture next door, that's always better, mm -hmm. uh, even if it costs a bit more, because you can be there and you can manage the process. Mm -hmm. okay. One uh, Fortune 500 uh, company that we were talking to, we got to know the medical director pretty well. And his line, which I love, and I remember, he said, you know, CROs are like home remodelers. I have yet to meet somebody that was happy with the one they hired afterwards. Um, that, that yeah. on, the, I, on the clinical trial side, absolutely. I have one, so if you want. <laughs> okay. That's always a first. <laughs> Not a CRO, of course, but a, a modeler. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the audience members also asked about an article from the Wall Street Journal, which was about funding by a firm or an entity called SoftBank. Has anybody heard of this? Mm -hmm. No? SoftBank? SoftBank. Yeah, and they're injecting billions of dollars into technology. I Maybe we should know is. them. <laughs> is, that, is that a Japanese entity? I don't know. Yeah, I know. So who asked the question? Are you Japanese. bold enough to stand up and tell us a little bit about it? Oh. Yeah. Okay. Okay, well, well, I guess you'll all take a look. I better go look at that article. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So another related question, question, when you're developing this relationship that we've really been talking about and it's a brand new technology, how long should you spend educating uh, your audience uh, be before they pull the trigger? Uh, That's the answer. Forever? As uh, long as it takes? It's, you are constantly educating. I mean, remember, you know more about your technology than anybody, right? So, right. And don't assume that the audience member, even if they're the smartest pe person with the, the most PhDs, in the area yeah. understand what you're talking about. Um, so I, I, I think education is a constant. I am always constantly, and I'm learning too, by the way, from my right. sciences, but you're always constantly updating them about it, you know, and, and, and so it's, it's a never ending, education doesn't end, in my opinion. Yeah. Minimize the misunderstanding. Pardon? Yeah. You need to minimize any misunderstanding okay. and maintain credibility throughout the entire process. Mm -hmm. I, I can share that on the in licensing side, I can share several instances where groups came to us with technology to evaluate, and when we got it in our hands, it did not do what they said, not even close. Mm -hmm. So, and I think there have been some publications recently from, I think, the head of R&D at Merck, where a very large fraction of their oncology molecules, actually, they can't reproduce the academic data. Uh, and that's a significant wow. issue. So when you give okay. something over, you need to make sure that what you're giving them and what you're representing is going to actually turn out to be true. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the only way to do that is to stay involved with the process and make sure that they don't make a mistake that then comes back on you. Yeah, the, the peril is, is lack of information as you continue to evolve versus too much information. And we've seen that with partners. We've seen it even in board meetings. I'm always amazed, mm -hmm. you know, we'll have a board meeting three months later and well, like I was really not that much to talk about and then you sit down to actually put it together and it's like oh, we did these 18 things but because you're doing them and you're making these little adjustments um, it's really easy to kind of start to separate in understandings from the people you're working with and you just can't let it happen because the downside's too great. I, I would also add on the education part of it be mindful of your audience right you have to be able to communicate to different audiences different ways. And the best analogy I use is that um, when I have small talk with people in the R&D area and we're getting ready for a meeting, we talk about Star Trek, right? Because they kind of understand all that stuff, right? They just, it's a different mindset. And that's not to be pejorative them, it's just a different appeal. But when I'm talking with the business guys or gals, I talk about sports because they're all very competitive, right? And they understand, you know, competition and, and how they, so, you have to be educating, speaking Star Trek and sports based on the audience you're dealing with. You're constantly educating them. But don't assume the head of R&D is going to understand the science that you're talking about at this level. And, and you have to be mindful when you bring your, your team, uh, whether it's your CSO or, or uh, your, your head of medical, you know, put them with the right person because you know, I've got some scientific folks that I, I, half the time I don't even understand what they're talking about. And I put them in front of some folks and they walk out of their head spinning. It says, it sounds good, but I don't know what it me meant. You know, and you have to be careful that you don't put the wrong instructor in front of the wrong student, right? Because they just won't get it. Even if it's all correct and right and valid and, and you're going, yeah, this is great, isn't it? And they're going, they're shaking their head, right? And they walk out of the room and say, did you understand the word he said? So many acronyms, I don't know. So just understand how to speak and educate at the appropriate levels. That's important. And I guess at the same time, trying not to talk down to your audience as well, right? I mean, there's a balance there somewhere, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me add one other point to that. I'm yeah. trying to give you all the tidbits of, you know, all the minefields that I've stepped on, by the way. So you, you have the benefit of 30 years of mistakes. The other is, uh, and this, this has always been, uh, I think, a pet peeve of a lot of big pharma companies. They ask about competition. And invariably, and, and I have made the same mistake, invariably the small company says, we don't have any competition. Ah. We're the first to come out with X, Y, and Z. We don't have any competition. The second that you do that in front of a venture capitalist, a big pharma company, whoever, your integrity and value just went right out the window. Because regardless of if you're the only company doing this technology in this field, you're the only one in town, there always is competition. And so be mindful of your integrity and, 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 and your reputation and be honest, right? And, and to just communicate honestly. Don't say, we don't have any competition because you want to sound like you're the best thing in town. It turns people off. It questions your technology. It questions everything about everything you just said. So that if I could leave you with that one bit, just be honest and 
And if you get asked that question, said, of course there's, there's competition. There's no one doing research in this field, but there's X, Y, and Z, and there's the unknown of this or the unknown of that. And it just shows that you've thought about it because that person's asking that question because they're going to go back to their manager and that same question is going to get asked. And they can't say there isn't any because that will look stupid. So make them look smart. So um, a great question too. What stage of product development is the most attractive to, to the big company? So what in, when in your Revenue view, producing. It, <laughs> uh, yeah. it sounds I like a chicken and a, an egg problem, though. No, but I think it's a fair, it's a, it's a good question, and I would tell you yeah. it depends on the company. Okay. I mean, it varies considerably. That, you know, five years ago they were doing hundred million dollar preclinical deals, right? I don't understand it, but they were doing that. They're not doing that anymore. They're doing late stage, more commercialization, ready products, um, because they're trying to fill a void. Usually, it's a revenue void. So it all depends on the strategy of the company. There are some companies that like to play multiple bets early on, hoping one of them hits. So they're, they're more earlier stage and more likely to, to, to have those dialogues in phase one and even preclinical. Um, those, those companies are starting to go away, but um, more likely they're willing to write you know, the $500 million check when it's registered and approved and ready to make money because they can actually issue a press release and start to count the revenue pretty quickly. So it depends on the company and the audience. Okay. In the in the field, right? So yeah. therapeutics and biotechs are different than med tech like us. Med, med tech, they, they want to buy you when you're revenue producing. And they'll tell you uh, after a couple drinks, you know, we'd rather really overpay for you. <laughs> you have yeah. $10 million in revenue uh, than when you're $5 million away from having $10 million in revenue because they don't get fired for that. Okay, so we're getting really close on time. I, I have a feeling we could do this probably for a lot longer. Um, so please, if you have questions afterward and, and you're still around, I'm, I'm sure you'll, you'll answer some of those. But so we're talking, if we just talk about the pitch and you need three or four things, and, and again, we're gonna have to be pretty quick, but what are those three or four things that in that pitch you absolutely have to address? I mean, you've talked about competition, that might be one, I don't know, but what are those three or four things? Uh, Michael, do you have something in mind? Well, certainly you've got to convince them that, you know, your product's going to make money. It's mm -hmm. whether it's a VC. So revenue product. You know, I had, as a scientist, it's, these are good lessons to learn if I'm speaking to you know, the scientists out there. Like, I don't care about the science. I, I may grant you that everything you tell me is correct. But you've got to show me how I'm going to make money with your company. How am I going to make money with your product? What kind of hole is it going to fill for me? Um, how are you differentiated? Let's get back to competition. I think you need to acknowledge your competition. You need to, in an honest but you know not too humble way, say how you are better. Uh, and I think those are those are key things. How much? How are you going to make money? Uh, fill that portfolio need, and then how are you differentiated? Uh, and and one point that was brought up here about the the last topic, uh, I would just add that uh, with regards to the stage of licensing. So obviously, as you degress the product, you're going to get paid more, but um, you can also screw things up. So one of the things that pharma likes is if they get to touch it from the very beginning and manage everything through the development process. And some of the most painful situations I've been in on the big pharma side are bringing something in-house and having to take a couple of steps back to redo things. Mm -hmm. uh, and so you can actually decrease the value of your asset if you screw things up and then try to outlicense it midway through. Great. And Joe, so we've got revenue proposition and the differentiation or competition, your place in the market. Anything else on that list for the pitch? For us, specifically in med tech, it's unmet medical need. What are the health economics around that unmet medical need? How are you differentiated and protectable by IP? And then depending on the audience, if, if it's somebody that wants to invest and then you take it from there, the team, they want to know a lot about the team. Uh, and if it's not, uh, it's what, what are, what's the exit math? What's your post money on your last round? What's the pre-money you expect this round? How much money do you need to get to cash flow? And what a company sell for after they get to cash flow? So it's they, they, they do the exit math. Great. I'm glad you mentioned IP in there. Thanks for that. <laughs> and you coached me well. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I didn't give you the microphone. <laughs> Steve? Uh, I mean, I, I would break it down into just really kind of three three key points. The first is uh, innovation. You, you've got to highlight that this is something new when it's different. I mean, whatever it is, it, you know, if you're, you had to basically say, this is a new target, this is a new technology, this is something new, new and different that you, know, you need to know about. The, the second part is, I call it validation. 
you got to have some sort of validation that whatever work that you're doing in this new different field makes sense, right? Whether it's uh, third party organization is validated, whether there's research somewhere, or whether the clinical data demonstrates that you know, the outcome is what it is. So you, know, you, you want to say uh, validation in some capacity. And the more of that, the better, right? In our field, it's, you know, in the oncology area, it's nice to say something like IU has done the research in this field, and by the way, they discovered this. Or MD Anderson has done research in our product, and guess what? They came up with the same conclusion. So validation is a really important point. And, and the third point, and, and it's kind of the fact of the, the, the value proposition, in other words, the money that you could make at the very end, but it's really what I think Joe mentioned earlier, the unmet medical need piece of it. Um, I can explain to anyone that if I have, uh, let's say, the cure to pancreatic cancer, it's going to make a lot of money. I don't have to say it's going to make a lot of money, but it will. And so when I say that, hey, you know, I've got this new technology that's been validated by some important organizations, and it's serving high met medical need. I think you don't have to be a rocket science to, scientist to figure out that that's a good business proposition to be part of. So those are the three things that in every conversation, the elevator speaks, that's what I would highlight. On that note, um, I'd like to give a special thanks to the panel for joining us today. Again, there were, yeah. <laughs> we'll stop it there.